thank you. Uh, uh, my job is to talk about the role of conversion to open cholecystectomy. I have uh, no disclosures. Uh, let's start with the 50,000 foot view. Uh, I think Mary was standing over my shoulder when I prepared this talk because the first thing that I'm going to say is that a culture of safety and cholecystectomy is much more than a critical view, and I think you just heard that from her a few minutes ago. So this is how I think about the culture of safety and cholecystectomy, the thought processes I go through. The first step uh, is to uh, define anatomy, to, f to uh, find the anatomy. And we do this through the critical view of safety, and sometimes intraoperative cholangiography, being also aware of ab aberrancy. And then if you get the critical view of safety, you're done. You don't have to think about step two or step three. But if you can't, then you have to recognize danger and know when to stop. And this is a challenging area that we need to do a lot of work in, but obviously one of the things that affects knowing when to stop are the conditions that you have in your hospital uh, your own, and your own skills and training. Uh, once you get to the point where you've decided you're not going to do a total cholecystectomy, then the step three is knowing how to bail out. And I think if you follow these steps, if you, this is the way you think, then this is what leads to safety. This is the culture of safety in cholecystectomy. Now, before we talk about what, can, what do you do after you convert, the first thing we should be thinking about, what can be done laparoscopically without conversion? Uh, and that depends upon conditions, so you can have three conditions. You can't find the gallbladder. This is very rare. This would be very bad inflammation if you can't find the gallbladder. After a lot of work, you can only find the dome of the gallbladder, and what's most common, you get down to the hepatocystic triangle, but you can't dissect, safe, safely dissect it. So what you do, if you can't find the gallbladder, I guess you better let someone else try to find it. That's one thing that you can do, or get help. Uh, laparoscopic cholecystostomy for when you can only see the dome. And this operation, which I think is going to come into more and more use, laparoscopic subtotal cholecystectomy, because surgeons don't like doing cholecystostomies, it means coming back and doing another operation. But with laparoscopic su subtotal uh, fenestrating cholecystectomy, it means not coming back uh, almost always. And what we've emphasized more and more and more, the other thing you can do laparoscopically or open is get help. So here's an example uh, of a picture of a, uh, inflammation in the right upper quadrant with the antrum, the colon, you have a lot of inflammation. This is the kind of case where you might not be able to find the gallbladder or if you find it, you only find the top. The other high-level view is a difference between 1990 and 2018. At that time, expertise in difficult open cholecystectomy was widespread. It's not true now, since there's little opportunity to train residents to perform difficult open cholecystectomy. The decision to convert and what to do after conversion must be tailored to the surgical skills available and the comfort level of the surgeon. This is what we call surgical judgment. So, uh, how to do the very difficult cholecystectomy. I used to have a talk with this with about 25 slides. I've now trimmed it down to one slide. Don't. You, you don't need to do a very difficult cholecystectomy ever. It's just not necessary and it's dangerous, especially if you haven't been trained to do them. So what to do after conversion when the critical view of safety can't be reached? So we have the same set of conditions and you've decided to convert. Uh, because of one of these conditions. So what, you can, what can you do? Well, you can convert and you can attempt to do an open cholecystectomy. And that's a proper thing to do. But you have to also have a backup plan just like you do when you're doing laparoscopic cholecystectomy. And the backup plan is if you can't do the total cholecystectomy, do a subtotal cholecystectomy, which is usually a pretty straightforward operation under these circumstances because you don't have to dissect the triangle, the hepatocystic triangle at all. And, uh, or do open cholecystostomy, so you need those options. Now, I'm not going to talk about dissection, open dissection, um, uh, but I, there's a couple of uh, things about uh, uh, operating at, at this point when you've got a lot of inflammation and you've converted. And this is a point uh, uh, that, this is a picture which shows the anatomy in the case 
that I just showed you with the momentum and the colon and the antrum drawn up here. These are often associated, you can have acute inflammation, it's often associated with chronic inflammation and shrinkage of the gallbladder, so that the distance between the top of the gallbladder when you finally find it and the bottom of the gallbladder, uh, which runs in, into, the, into the, uh, the bottom of the cystic plate, which runs into the sheath of the right portal pedicle, can only be two, two centimeters. So if you dissect from above under these conditions, taking the gallbladder off the so-called top-down technique, it's very easy to get into the portal vein and have the disaster. This is what happens if you go from on top in acute and chronic inflammation with a shrunken gallbladder, it, it, one can get into true disaster. Now, um, th this technique, uh, which I call a Honda technique, has been popularized by Goro Honda. He uses a names, anatomical names, which I don't agree with, but the idea of dissecting from the front and the back and actually coming through, but not in the patocystic triangle, above the patocystic triangle, is actually very helpful. Uh, and I think it's particularly helpful when you have that edematous gallbladder that can be lifted off the cystic plate very easily this way. And then you can go back and dissect towards the patocystic triangle and, and that really does help. So I want to point out the difference between these two things. You can see that the direction of dissection is at right angles to each other. This is okay. This is not okay if you have a short uh, cystic plate because you get into the cystic plate, the fibrous tissue in the plate looks just like the fibrous tissue on the sheath of the right portal pedicle and you get into disaster. Now, I could talk for a few minutes about the actual reasons that conversion takes place in laparoscopic cholecystectomy and what is its actual role in practice and what can we learn from this. So I'm going to talk to you about a paper, well, the chief author was one of our residents, Rohina Pani, and this paper you'll find it in the same issue of TG18. Uh, all the papers from TG18 are in there and this was presented last June when we were doing TG18 in Tokyo. So one of the, there are numerous, a number of aims here, but one of the aims was to determine if there's evidence that conversion of acute cholecystitis is actually indicative of severe inflammation. Well, of course it is. We all know it is from our experience. But what can we learn about this? Was there anything quantitative that we could learn? So what we did was we searched uh, for papers that had three things in the title, laparoscopic cholecystectomy, acute cholecystitis, and conversion. Uh, and some other exclusion factors. So we came up with 11 papers that were published between 2000 and 2015, and uh, they're from 11 countries. Uh, and then we determined what led to conversion, and eight studies gave some detail. Now, I don't, at the back of the room, you're not going to be able to read this, but I'll tell you that everything that's in red talks about inflammation. So in all eight papers that gave some detail, it, all of them talked about uh, inflammation. Some of them also talked about an ability to define anatomy due to inflammation. But there was something else that we found in these descriptions, and that's shown in green. Adhesions. Strangely, seven of the eight papers referred to adhesions, and here's a paper that talks about a fibrotic gallbladder and cystic duct. Now, this is an acute cholecystitis, adhesions. Now, I've seen a bunch of videos on acute cholecystitis here and, uh, in the last few days, and I've I, I didn't hear the word adhesion once because the gallbladders that are being shown and they're being described are the kind of very edematous, thick-walled gallbladder that you see in acute cholecystitis that peels off the cystic plate. They don't have a lot of adhesion. So what does this mean? Why would there be adhesion? So we have to think about this a little bit. So here's, here's some quantitative data. So uh, between 90, 75 and 91% of cases were for severe uh, inflammation and adhesions, and the other were for some other reasons, like suspected bile duct injury, hemorrhage. Those might be due to, to inflammation too, concern for malignancy, need for common bile duct expiration, et cetera. So most of them were due to acute inflammation. So the reasons for conversion, about 85% of the time, conversion is done for severe inflammation, including adhesions, and 15% of the time is done for unclear anatomy, hemorrhage, suspected bile duct injury, and suspected malignancy. So then we wanted to look for predictors of conversion in acute cholecystitis. 
The problem is, is that there's a lot of heterogeneity in these studies. Not only is there a lot of heterogeneity, but there's a lot of what I call possibly hidden heterogeneity. So there's information that's omitted from the paper, so you can't even tell if there's heterogeneity. So that's even worse because you can't correct for it because you don't know if it's there or not. So we couldn't do uh, meta-analysis uh, because of the heterogeneity, so I display the data uh, in this way. Here you see the studies down the left-hand side and the factors across the top. They're categorized by history, physical exam, et cetera. So here we have maleness, age, BMI, interval between onset uh, and operation, fever, et cetera, et cetera. Now what the colors mean in this heat map mean this. This factor was significantly related to conversion uh, in a multivariate analysis. And the light uh, red or pink is for a univariate analysis, significant for a univariate analysis, and the green not significant in a univariate analysis and a dark green not significant in a multivariate analysis. So you can see there's a lot of heterogeneity in this also because some of them just didn't do multivariate analyses. So what did we find were the, were the strongest factors uh, looking at the data in this way? Well, they were maleness, age, and white blood cell count. Interval uh, was positive in three studies, but there was no multivariate analysis. So that was hard to evaluate. I just come back to these things, maleness, age, and white blood cell count. This is, acute, this is in acute cholecystitis, really strange, because white blood cell count is associated with inflammation, but what about maleness and age? What, how is that related to inflammation? So, it was unexpected that maleness and age would be such a strong predictor of conversion in acute cholecystitis. Maleness and age, however, are strong predictors of, of conversion in elective cholecystectomy, and not just in acute cholecystitis. And they probably reflect several things, but one thing that they may reflect is chronic scarring more than acute inflammation. Aha, so now that's why adhesions make sense. That's why these people are talking about adhesions and maleness and age relate. So this data suggests that conversion on acute cholecystitis is more likely when there is both chronic inflammation from previous attacks of acute cholecystitis and current acute inflammation. So these are not the cases that are usually put up at meetings with a big extended gallbladder, thick wall that's dissected off. These are different gallbladders that have chronic inflammation with an attack of acute inflammation superimposed. That's what results in uh, conversion. So to finish, I want to come back to this idea of top-down cholecystectomy because under circumstances where there's chronic inflammation, acute inflammation, you have acute inflammation, but the gallbladder may not be that big bloated gallbladder, but a much smaller, tough-looking gallbladder. Uh, and if you start going in behind that gallbladder, trying to peel it off, and you keep going for two or three centimeters, you have the possibility of disaster. So in conclusion, severe inflammation making anatomical identification difficult is the chief reason for uh, consider considering conversion. Maleness, age, and increased white blood cell count are preoperative predictors of this type of severe inflammation and are indicators that acute and chronic inflammation might coexist. One caveat, these are not the best studies, and these, this, is, this is worth, this is a, in a hypothesis stage with some data to support the hypothesis, but we like to see better studies to elucidate this for sure. Open surgery under these conditions is often difficult and carries increased risk, and the conduct of the procedure, including bailout strategy, should be tailored to the surgical skills available to the surgeon's comfort. There's no one size that fits a strategy under these circumstances. As a priority, avoidance of biliary injury outranks completion of total cholecystectomy. This is true before and after conversion. Finally, most systems grading severity of acute cholecystitis grade only the acute cholecystitis, that is, the edematous and the gangrenous cholecystitis. We need to include the degree of concomitant chronic cholecystitis, fibrosis, and adhesions, especially in histologic grading. Thank you.